My name is Mike Gabin and welcome to my KSP campaign. On the pad here we have Svetlana and you Luya, sorry, uh, aboard the Kuryus. Uh You can see I've slimmed it down a little bit uh, since the last time, gone with a 1.875 meter uh, main booster with only two radial boosters. We'll see how that goes. But what I thought would be fun with this one, because you've seen this vehicle before, is uh, to launch it completely from the uh, interior view. So uh, we're on our way to Kerbin Station. I have it targeted. You can see the purple target icon. I'm just waiting for it to get a little bit ahead of my launch site. What you also might be noticing is that I have some exterior views. Um, these are exterior cameras provided by the raster prop monitor. And uh, I don't know, I've been underutilizing them, I think. So I got three views going. Okay, here comes our launch. Well, I'll explain the views as we go. And we're off. So, uh, yeah, the middle camera there is pointing straight down the main booster. You can see it's giving us a good view of one of the radial boosters. Uh, the camera on the right is on the orbiter pointing straight up, looking right at the tail end of the uh, escape tower, while the camera on the left is on the orbiter pointing straight back. And both of those cameras can mysteriously see through the fairing. I'm not quite sure what's up with that, but uh, I, I know I can deal with that. You can see I've also turned off the uh, Kerbal Engineer display, so I'm going to completely rely on what we can get here from the cockpit. Though I will admit there are two places where I have to leave IVA view before my docking. Oh, there's Luya. She's having a great time. How's Svetlana doing here? Oh, yeah, well, she's her usual self, I suppose. Poor Svetlana. You know that, uh, speaking of poor Svetlana, it has been... 210 game days since she's been in space. I feel a little bad about that. It's been all Jeb and Val uh, piling my crafts in space while all my other pilots have been relegated to uh, atmospheric jet duty. Um, so I thought it'd be time to start to change that. In fact, Svetlana was actually my first Kerbal way back in episode 8 to achieve an orbit. Not only did she achieve an orbit, she absolutely shattered speed and altitude records at the time. Um, and th that weren't broken for almost a hundred days when Bob did his uh, the first flyby of the moon. So uh, yeah, it, she's a little bit overdue to say the least. Okay, why don't we use the opportunity to talk a little bit about what's coming up in this episode? Uh, we will be revisiting the Arm B as it leaves Kerbin's sphere of influence. You might recall that that was launched last episode on its way to rendezvous with a B-class asteroid. You won't be seeing that rendezvous. Uh, this episode, but I, I'm guessing probably next episode looking at the timing of all this The Otter 4 is going to perform another flight in an effort to try and scrounge up What little science there still remains around Kerbin and oh wait wait I shouldn't do that. We're coming up to booster separation. We'll talk about that display next Yeah, let's see how the booster separation looks like from the screen here There we go Bye, Booster. Okay, yeah, why don't we take a look at this main screen? This has uh, got a lot of, it's got, uh, you know, apoapsis and periapsis and time to those things uh, on the display there, but I really like this display here. It's showing our trajectory. There's the uh, Kuryu's right there, and there's Kerbin Station in orange, and that's, of course, where we're going. That gray line in between represents Kerbin's atmosphere. So some in useful information in that nice graphic. Um, I guess the main event for this particular mission, though, is going to be uh, the launch of Minmus Station. I have a contract to put a space station around Minmus. Uh, has to have five Kerbals and power and antennas and all of that kind of stuff. But I thought this time I'd build it all in one big go rather than with modules, so that's going to be coming up in this episode as well. Anyway, despite doing this from interior view pretty much the whole way, uh, the rest of this mission went pretty routinely, so why don't we cut to just some of the highlights. Uh, the first of which actually is the staging of the fairing I thought looked pretty cool from inside. Just keep an eye on that right upper screen. Ooh. So there goes our abort tower. So now we do not have a fairing anymore around the Kuryu, so we should have a view out the window here. Oh, I can just see, oh, rotate the other way. 
There we are. You can just see Kerb in there. Not in orbit just yet, but getting... Oh, you can see uh, bits of fairing drifting in our rear view camera. That's pretty cool. Anyway, I did the whole circularization uh, from inside here. That was easy enough with the information that was coming from raster prop monitor. And then I had to uh, leave interior view. First time to open up the uh, solar panels. Yeah, it would be nice. I don't have I don't have general action groups yet uh, because I still have to, I'm still got a level two vehicle assembly building. So uh, you know I could have done that with action groups if I had them available. But uh, no, that's it. And I had to actually leave a, again interior view to set up and uh, perform the burn to rendezvous with the station. I could have done this using the intercept angle, which does come with Kerbal Engineer and uh, knowing what the altitude of the station was going to be, but. Uh, I decided I wanted to keep Kerbal Engineer closed, so I'm, I'm doing it this the old school stock way, I suppose. After that, it was pretty easy to perform the rest of the rendezvous just from inside here. I mean, I got this orbital display screen where I can watch my approach. It even shows the little pur purple uh, closest approach icon, so uh, it was easy to time warp to that. And then up here, I do have my distance to target and my relative velocity, so... That wasn't that bad. And then once when I was in within within a few kilometers, I just switched that bottom display over to the nav ball where you have your standard uh, prograde, retrograde, and target icons. So it was just the same sort of deal of as you approach your target, you just kind of heard that retrograde icon towards the target icon and uh, maybe a little bit unnerving because through all of this, I could never really see the station, so you just have to sort of trust all your instruments. Um, I felt a little bit better when I finally did manage to catch the station in my rear view camera, so I could say, oh, okay, there it is. I'm not just about to crash into it. And then once I was down within 100 meters of the station, I brought my relative velocity down to under half a meter per second. I am playing this a little cautiously. Uh, and then I had to go into out of exterior view mode one more time. I think I mentioned I did it twice, but actually you can see here this is my third time doing it. This time to select the docking port as my control point. Again, action groups would have been nice, but uh, you know what can you do? And then I could have brought I can bring up the uh, there it is the uh, docking alignment indicator on there and. Oh shoot! I can't. I can't uh, select my docking port from here. Okay, so we'll have to open up the docking alignment indicator mod. And uh, oh, oh! I just lost my target. Ah, oh, shoot! Happens <laughs> some. Sometimes you just click on stuff, and then KSB thinks the target is gone. Okay, so I'll have to go into Kerbal Engineer. Open up just the rendezvous window just so that I can select my target. There we go. We're back on that again. And I want the starboard berth. Yeah, naming these docking ports and knowing which one's where really helps. Okay, that's the one I want. So we can close that. All right. And there we go. And oh, wait, I want the window closed. I want to get rid of that rendezvous data. I don't need that anymore. There we go. Okay, and then we can get rid of that. And now we can perform the docking. And you see me perform dockings using docking alignment indicator before, so I don't think I need to belabor that anymore. But I did have one more kind of unnerving moment. And again, this has to do with not really seeing where stuff is and just trusting your instruments. When uh, I was moving laterally towards my docking port, when all of a sudden the uh, other curious that is docked with the station suddenly came into view and I was much closer to it than I thought I was. Yeah, I got to be careful about this. I mean, the space station has stuff sticking out the sides and that. Uh, you can't just move laterally, blindly near the station. It would be pretty easy to sideswipe something. So I think if I did this again, I would keep myself a good distance away, line up the docking ports, and then move forward towards the docking port. Anyway, uh, just to explain, actually, I don't think I talked about all this and never talked about why Svetlana and Louie are up here. They're up here for the next mission. Uh, I, I actually have two missions in mind. One is I do have a Kerbal in orbit about the moon that needs to be rescued. Uh, and number two is I want to send some more Kerbals out of Kerbin's sphere of influence again just for the experience. Blow past the moon this time instead of Minmus. Remember the uh, Parian 
uh, blew by Min Mist to get experience for those Kerbals. So I want to blow by the moon with some Kerbals that have not been by the moon before. And then go exit Kerbal's Kerbin Sphere of Influence to get some more experience into my Kerbal's uh, issue. Um, yeah, the Karayan, uh, well, it's kind of out there, isn't it? And in fact, at this moment, it's still about 11 days from exiting Kerbin Sphere of Influence because uh, I took the energy efficient slow route and scenic route by Minmus. Uh, and then it's got to still come back, which should be quicker, but still, it's not going to be back for a while yet. Uh, so if these guys are going to do anything, uh, they need a vehicle. They don't have a vehicle that can do anything more than just boot around and low orbit around Kerbin. So after a little bit of thought, I realized I need another Kerbin system runabout. I need another Karayan. So that began the process of building Karayan 2. Now the, the original Karayan is a pretty old vessel, so I've unlocked a lot of new parts since then. Um, it, it's again going to use the uh, modules from homegrown rockets it's sort of its crew cabins but I'm gonna be using these inline orbital modules which are pretty sweet so instead of holding just four Kerbals which the Karayan can this guy will hold up to seven but what I'm more excited about are actually getting into the first generation of nuclear thermal rockets that come from Kerbal Interstellar uh, so we'll put those on there and uh, I'm not gonna show you the whole process of designing this thing i'll talk about the design and how it works and everything when uh when we get to actual launch day uh but for now i'll just show you that i did push it into the building queue and then pushed it up to the top and as you can see here it's going to take a little over 20 days to build again the karayan is about 11 days from exiting the kerbin sphere of influence and then it's got to come back so i am not entirely sure whether this will get to svetlana and company before or after the Karayan returns back home, but uh, that's going to have to be obviously for a future episode. Right now we have a couple of brief stops to make before we get to our Minmus station launch. Uh, the first of which is Valentina and Bob here in the desert that is to the west of uh, the KSC. Yeah, if, you, if you just go to the west of the mountain range that's right behind the Kerbal Space Center and go to that opposite coast you'll find a small patch of desert there. So that's where we are and we're scrounging science once again uh, making most of the science coming from this atmospheric scanner that Bob right now is collecting the data from and uh, we're trying to hit as many biomes as we can uh, you know briefly landing to collect the data getting back up collecting more data and all that kind of stuff. Pretty routine, well, except for a couple of things. Uh, number one is there is, on the west side of the mountain range behind the Kerbal Space Center, there is this uh, patch of area that is completely landable in with a small aircraft uh, that counts as mountains. So I thought, you know what? I'm gonna be putting this thing down in there. And it is, as you can see, just over the ridge here and there. We've just switched the mountains. And look at this. I mean, that's, that's pretty flat. We're going to put it down in here. So, turning off the engines. And we're just going to coast in here nice and carefully. And you can see I have it in reverse thrust mode. I just love the reverse thrust that came in on this Weasley engine with 1.05 it's great so we're just gonna kill off our velocity this thing has a stall velocity in around 40 or 50 meters per second so we're just gonna get down to just a little bit above that and we're just gonna drop it Ooh, well, a little hard but that eh, worked all right whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> we're okay <laughs> there we go all right so there we are we are in the mountains with this plane Excellent. And of course, Bob's going to go out there, collect himself some more science. But uh, then I had another idea. Uh, you might recall a couple of episodes ago, uh, this, this, this uh, vessel had a brush with the Kraken uh, when I tried to land it in the water and then collect some uh, science from the water. Um, and then last episode, I landed the Otter 3, my other jet plane, in the water uh, to collect water science once again and uh, it collected it just fine no Kraken attack this time but for whatever reason it isn't in 
uh, I didn't register the science when I when I went to check in the research and development center. Uh, that science is at zero still for water, atmospheric sensor scan in the water. So uh, yeah, we're gonna tempt fate uh, one more time and try to put this guy down into the water. All right, just about there. Okay, splash down. Uh, again, so far so good. Except it did seem the Kraken liked to attack once I EVA out, EVA out my Kerbals. Now last time I put Valentina onto the wing, so this time I'm going to keep her up here on the fuselage. Uh, try and keep her off the wing. She needs to get away from the science stuff so that Bob can get there and collect it. Well, get back up there, Valentina. There you go. Okay, now let's switch over to Bob. Ah! Oh, well, as far as bugs go, at least this one is reproducible. Okay, there's Valentina. <laughs> She's safe. Bob, once again, is inside the crew cabin, so we can switch over to Bob. We have lots of bits around. That's still not Bob. Bob, Bob, Bob. Where is Bob? One of these bits has got a Bob in it. There we are. And we'll EVA out Bob. We'll try and see if we can do the science. And thankfully this time I was able to grab science, run the science experiment from here. And then I got it into my head that maybe, uh, maybe the re I need to get Bob back in here. I don't know why. Like to recover the science, download it, and then get back into the capsule. And maybe that will make it so I have this science and I won't lose it. And uh, come on, Bob, get in there. Whoa. Okay, <laughs> that's enough of this. Oh my gosh, I hate this. Okay, let's let's just recover and get the heck out of here. And checking the science log, I can now see that I do have atmospheric analysis from Kerbin's water, 5.4 science. So there we go, we're done. Take that, Kraken. Okay, here we are with Arm B. It's about two hours away from leaving Kerbin's sphere of influence. And I'm not going to spend really much time with it. Um, it turned out, like, once I left the Kerbin sphere of influence, I tried to adjust my course and close my closest encounter distance with the asteroid, but uh, that turned out to be way too twitchy from this distance, so I decided to put it off for a few game days and come back to it, and you'll be seeing that next episode. But what we are here for is to show you a major uh, design flaw. <laughs> it could end up becoming a fatal design flaw as far as this mission goes. Right now I'm just trying to get a look at Kerbin. I always like looking at Kerbin when we're way out here. So I'm just using the flight computer to try and point myself right at Kerbin so that I can use that as a line of sight to see Kerbin and a battery short circuits. You just notice that. Now normally that's not an unusual nor a big deal except for, well, this is my design oversight. This is my only battery bank. Yeah, I unlock these 1.25 meter uh, battery banks and, you know, they hold a thousand units of electricity and I thought a thousand's more than enough, which it is, until it shorts out and now I'm down to 15 and I am losing electricity quickly. And that's a real problem because, uh, you know, I am playing with remote tech and if power goes dead, my signal is lost and I will have no more control of this. So I'm putting this right back to the previous orientation, its previous attitude to get those solar cells uh, charging once again. That's looking pretty good. And there you go. You can see that they're charging and they're charging and they get to 15 and they stop. And that's because the only battery on this thing right now is the battery from the probe body. That is it. I have 15 kilojoules of electricity instead of 1,015. That could be a problem because you saw how quickly that electricity was coming down. That's because of that dish antenna. It drains power pretty quick, but I can't close that dish antenna because obviously I would be losing my remote tech signal if I did that. Uh, so this could potentially be problematic. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have to see how this goes in a future episode, but um, well, yeah, it is going to be what it's going to be. All right, onwards to our last mission of this particular video. This is Minmus Station, an all-in-one station. 
on its way, obviously, to Minmus. I uh, got a contract just to put this thing into orbit around Minmus and money for me, though uh, this is a perfect example of how I uh, am not making money very quickly because this, I got, uh, I don't know, I get out of control and I end up building something that costs more than what I get from the contract. But I want cool space stations, what am I going to do? <laughs> Actually, one thing you might be noticing from this particular uh, launch is that you will not see the KOS window because I am not flying with KOS. I am flying it completely manually. Uh, the KOS script was too, uh, well, too rough on this uh, delicate little vehicle. Well, I guess it's not really little, but it is delicate. If... Uh, I veer very, f any, well, even getting towards the edge of that uh, prograde vector, um, I, I lose it. <laughs> it's gone with that big fairing at the top, and KOS couldn't handle it, so I am going uh, manually. I put more delta V than I normally would into the launcher because I knew I would be going up, uh, concentrating not on making a perfect launch pro profile but concentrating more on just staying on that prograde vector so this is what it is and uh, i guess you can also see there are no kerbals on this thing i you know uh this would be a dangerous thing to put kerbals in and launch it because things could go badly so and there is no kind of a port system so no kerbals we will send kerbals out i don't know sometime when uh when i need kerbals out there but we are coming up to our first booster separation so uh, we'll just watch that and then we'll move on to a higher point of this ascent because booster separations are cool there we go normally I would have rolled this thing by the way but uh, no 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 fancy maneuvering this time around so here we are performing our circularization burn uh, you can see that I strutted the bejeebus out of this thing to try and keep it stiff as uh, it went up on top of its lifter. That was really the main problem that KOS had. Um, I guess the main feature is that antenna array up there at the top. Did I really need it? No, not really, <laughs> but I thought it looked cool. The two small antennas can reach anywhere within the Kerbin system and the large dish antenna can reach all the way out to Drez. Uh, do, I don't need it but I like it, so there it is. It has a total of five docking ports on it, so that if in the future I wanted to extend on this thing, I could. It uh, it has, uh, let's see, five kerbals, right? Uh, four in the Hitchhiker can, and then I have the Coppola module on top for the, for the uh, fifth kerbal. And it also has one of those KIS storage containers with lots of KIS goodies, which is really where I end up spending the bulk of my money on all those um, KIS struts and uh, fuel pipes and other miscellaneous doodads that I stuff in there. And here we are, a couple of days later, getting ready to perform a correction burn. And apologize for all of those time jumps but you've seen me come out to Mimis a number of times before you know how it's done so I thought I'd just sort of cut to the chase here a little bit and actually as we're getting ready to do this uh, this maneuver um, I do have a bit of a long-range plan other than simply fulfilling this contract and as we uh, perform this correction burn I want you to take a look down there at sort of the very sort of south and a little bit to the west uh, quadrant of Minmus, you will see I have a Kerbal there on EVA. That particular Kerbal is Gilly Kerman. Gilly Kerman is there and needs some rescuing. So that is why you're seeing me set up my trajectory so I'm set up to put myself into a polar orbit around Minmus. But it's a little bit more than just simply getting this Kerbal off of the surface and back to Kerbin. Uh, she also has a Gilly Scrap, and that is, I can't remember, it's a command pod or it's a cockpit or something like that. I need to get that off the surface and that back to Kerbin as well. So that's going to make this whole thing a little bit more involved. So I'm thinking that this station will form a bit of a base of operations for this entire rescue mission well, sometime in the future. Uh, right now, I'm just going to need to get this thing into orbit, fill this contract. Got a lot of other things going on in the Kerbin system, but uh, we'll have to come back to this sometime in the future. In the meantime, it's going to be about eight and a half days for this thing to get to Minmus's sphere, sphere of influence. 
Uh, and that's not going to occur in this episode. we got a lot of things going on all at the same time. Don't forget the Karain is still out there on its way leaving the Kerbin system too. So uh, lots going on. Lots of stuff for future episodes. We're going to be drawing this one to a close. I thank you for watching and hope to see you next time.